Okay, uh, those of you who are watching by YouTube, or do watch by YouTube, we are in the book of Acts, yet in Acts chapter 4, and uh, so we appreciate, I don't know how many times we hear from people, maybe have never been here, or we meet them someplace, and they say, oh yeah, we watch you on YouTube, and it's kind of surprising. I know when we first started uh, putting our messages on YouTube, we had somebody from Russia watching. So uh, it's kind of interesting who, uh, <laughs> who watches. And the only uh, side effect, I'll call it, of that being on YouTube is that people just stay home. They don't come to church. They just stay home and watch you on YouTube. <laughs> it's much easier. But anyway, uh, we appreciate those who watch by YouTube. And I know some of you are here because of, of, because of that. Of being on YouTube. So, anyway, we just uh, hope you have a uh, blessed time in the Word this morning as we go into the book of Acts in chapter 4. Okay, we finished Acts chapter 3 last Sunday, and we're in Acts chapter 4, but again, I keep bringing up this biblical timeline because that should be something that's kind of in your head. Uh, every time you look at Scripture, is uh, well, what portion of Scripture? Are you reading? What is the context? Who wrote it? And uh, uh, where is that on the timeline? All the way from Adam, all the way up through uh, the future, when there will be the new heavens and new earth. So I just cut part of it out here, and oh, we have uh, from the time of Adam, oh, there's time of Adam to Abraham is 2,000 years. And uh, in, our, in our Bible, uh, those first 2,000 years are the first 11 chapters of Genesis, and that's it. That covers 2,000 years, and we don't realize that sometime. That from Adam until uh, Abraham was 2,000 years. It all, it's all covered by the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Then from Abraham uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ and his ministry uh, is another 2,000 years. Now the timeline I have up here is the timeline that was presented in the scriptures throughout the Old Testament, through the Old Testament prophets, uh, the four gospels, which we have, which is called the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and, Luke, and John, and also the first part of Acts, is all concerning the timeline or God's dealing with the nation of Israel. So. When we're in the book of Acts here, remember in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost, uh, which you see, Pentecost is right here. Just to, Here's the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ, Acts chapter 1. And right after that, we have Acts chapter 2. We have Pentecost, which is a Jewish feast day, 50 days after the resurrection. And uh, <clears throat> the message or the the gospel which was presented in the four gospels by John the Baptist, by the Lord Jesus Christ, by the 12 apostles was the, the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel, the good news of this time period right here. And if you read the gospels, many times it says the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God which is at hand. At hand, meaning it's about to be ushered in. Well, if you follow the Old Testament scriptures and the, the New Testament up into the first part of Acts, you'll see that the whole theme, the gospel, was the gospel of the kingdom. And we've looked at those passages before, but we get into the book of Acts. Now we have at, at Pentecost there, and uh, we have those that were in the upper room, the 120 that was in the upper room in Jerusalem, uh, which is considered the little flock from in Matthew and in John it's called the little flock in other words a small group of believers they were in this upper room at Pentecost and of course the Holy Spirit came and filled them with, a, with power they were filled with the Holy Spirit and in order to, for other uh, people at that time to notice that and to see that you notice that they, it looked as though there were tongues of fire sitting on top of them on top of their head now, it wasn't actually fire, but it was, it seemed as, <laughs> tongues of fire. And also, immediately after that, they began to speak in tongues, all of these 120 in the upper room. 
Well, so what's going on? They started to speak in other languages that were known around the earth. In the world at that day, there were a lot of different languages around the world that the Jews, being uh, uh, for some time living in different parts of the world, uh, learned other languages. And at the Feast of Pentecost, of course, all these Jews from all around the world came to Jerusalem for the feast day. And all these Jews that were speaking other languages, now all of a sudden, they heard these 120 that were in the upper room speaking their language. And that was, of course, was a miracle that God gave through the Holy Spirit, gave them power to speak in other tongues or other languages. Some of them at Pentecost said, now wait a minute, what's going on here? These, these men are drunk because they couldn't understand them. A lot of them couldn't. And, uh, but Peter, the spokesman of the twelve, he stood up and he says, oh, not so. He says, it's only the third hour of the day, which was nine o'clock in the morning. He says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Prophet Joel wrote back, back in here, what did he write about? He wrote about this tribulation period, the seven years right here. And Peter says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. That's what was happening at Pentecost. It was the beginning of this tribulation period and how the Holy Spirit was going to work during this time. Now, we know the tribulation period hasn't happened yet. That's still in the future, as far as we are concerned. And that is what these Old Testament prophets back here wrote concerning the tribulation period and the times of refreshing, which we saw in Acts chapter 3 that Peter referred to, uh, they spoke about this time period here and the tribulation period right here. And the reason it's seven years is because that is the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy. We know that in the past, 69 of those weeks of years, and every week is seven years, so 69 of those weeks have already taken place. And it's, that's easy to figure out if you go back and look at the uh, um, different empires that uh, Daniel spoke of during this 490 years, those 70 weeks of years, 69 of those weeks have already taken past, and they are, in, they are history. And, uh, but what happened, there's the one week left, and that one week is right here to be fulfilled. Now, we're going to talk about what happened in, in here, why we haven't seen the tribulation period yet, and we weren't back here either at, at Pentecost. So where are we? Well, we're going to get to that as we go through the book of Acts here and say, where are we at? Well, right now, we are on this timeline, not any place. You can't go any place in relationship to the scriptures and find us, the body of Christ, in any of that, that timeline. So we'll... we'll as we continue through the book of Acts, we will find out when that takes place and when we, as members of the body of Christ, uh, believing in the Lord Jesus Christ today, uh, get involved or become part of the timeline uh, in the future. So right now, we're, we're in Acts chapter 4. Uh, that has not happened yet. There's no body of Christ yet. There isn't any information about the body of Christ. The body of Christ has not begun, which I've said many times is the biggest blunder of the church today, and that is that the body of Christ, the church, which is called the church, started in Acts chapter 2. That's the biggest blunder of the church today. I don't know how many churches, fundamental churches, uh, believe that the body of Christ, which we are members of today, started in Acts chapter 2. Uh, which it did not, which we've pointed out since we started in the book of Acts, it is entirely Jewish. There are no Gentiles involved whatsoever. And we know the members of the body of Christ are made up in Jew and Gentile alike. We're on the same ground, and that certainly was not the case in Acts chapter 2. Gentiles were completely outside of the commonwealth of Israel, which we're going to see here. So, we are right here in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 4. Uh, Pentecost has uh, uh, just taken place, and now we're seeing what the apostles are doing here. So, um, just a, a note of review here. Remember, Peter, uh, Peter, when he uh, was preaching in Acts chapter 3 there, 
he says that if you would believe, repent, and be baptized, every one of you, and be saved, your sins would be taken away, and you'd be, have salvation, and the times of refreshing would come. This, this kingdom would come. Well, why would it come? Because if they believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, then the second coming right here, the Lord Jesus Christ would come back to earth, set up his kingdom, which is exactly what they were looking for back in here, throughout the Gospels and the Old Testament, that he would come back to earth. So the time of refreshing was at hand. And uh, <clears throat> so, how, in Matthew chapter 16, we're just going to look at that very briefly here. It says in, in uh, um, Matthew 16, 18 and 19, it says, I say unto thee that thou art Peter. Now, Christ is speaking here. He's speaking to Peter. And he says, and upon this rock I will build my church. Now, I've got to clarify something there. On this rock, that rock is not Peter. There's a whole denomination today built on that particular uh, falsehood. That Peter was the rock or the first pope. Not so. Look into the scriptures and look at the, the original words and so forth. And it's no way that that can be. The rock is the Lord Jesus Christ. And, of course, that is when his church will be built on, which we're seeing happening in the first part of Acts there. It said, The gates of hell shall not prevail against it, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. The Lord Jesus Christ was giving Peter the keys to the kingdom of heaven, or the keys to this kingdom right here. And is not that what Peter preached or said in Acts chapter 3? Uh, he, uh, he said if they would believe, uh, their rulers would, at the times of refreshing would come. That was the key, is the offer of the kingdom. If they would just believe, the rulers of the nation of Israel would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he was God, he rose from the dead, then Christ would come back and set up his kingdom. And uh, that's the only offer that we see in Scripture, really, the offer of the kingdom. Okay, now, continuing on, the last couple of verses of Acts chapter 3, we've got to look at that. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he has so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing, that kingdom time, shall come, from what? From the presence of the Lord, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. And ye shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, that's during the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, the three years. And by the way, the Lord Jesus Christ ministered unto the nation of Israel. He did not minister to the Gentiles. Sometimes we forget that, but the entire ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ was to the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. Okay, and he shall send Jesus, which before was preached unto you, whom heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things. The time of restitution is the end of the tribulation period. When Christ comes back at the second coming is when he will set straight everything at that particular time. He will uh, judgment upon the earth at that particular time. And it says, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Now I want you to notice that in... <laughs> what bank here I guess it is it says since the world began okay this was prophesied that all these things would happen uh, back since the world began put it back here it would go to Old Testament prophets and you look at it and it's all talking about this times of refreshing the kingdom time period um, <clears throat> but there's something you have to notice here it says, which God has spoken by the mouth of holy, his holy prophets since the world began. The message that we have today, through the Apostle Paul, from the Lord Jesus Christ, was what? Kept secret since the world began. Romans 16, 25 and 26. Paul writes and he says, Now to him that is of power to establish you, According to my gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. So the truth of the body of Christ, Jew and Gentile alike, 
in the body of Christ was never made known, never began until it was given to the Apostle Paul and to the, Gentile, the Apostle of the Gentiles, which we'll see has not happened yet in Acts chapter 4, and we'll see it until at least Acts chapter 9 and beyond. Because at this particular time, which we're going to see, Saul at that time, who later became Paul, was persecuting the Christians in Jerusalem and all around the, the area at that particular time. He hated the Lord Jesus Christ and Christians. He wasn't even saved yet. So uh, he has not revealed nothing. God has not revealed the truth of the body of Christ, the revelation of the mystery, until the Apostle Paul comes on the scene. Okay, uh, the last couple of verses of 23, of, of chapter 3, maybe we're not even get to chapter 4 today. <laughs> Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise told of these days. Okay. You know how much of your Bible is from Samuel on, the prophets that spoke about these days of Pentecost, the tribulation period, the thousand year reign, the kingdom? Uh, I just quickly looked at it here and made a mark, but um, take your Bible that much, which is over half of the, of, you know, the page of your Bible, that talk about this kingdom, the tribulation period, about the nation of Israel, what's going to happen to them, uh, and so forth, all concerning the nation of Israel. You cannot find not one single word in the Old Testament or part of the New Testament, the Gospels, the first part of Acts, not one single word concerning the body of Christ, the gospel of the grace of God, which we are part of today. Never was it revealed until the Apostle Paul comes on the scene, until he is saved in Acts chapter 9. Well, notice it says, Ye are the children, this is Peter, Speaking to those Jews at Pentecost, ye are the children or sons of the prophets and of the covenant. Now there are many covenants in scripture, but here he says of the covenant, which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you, in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Right there, Peter is expressing to the rulers of the nation of Israel how the covenant made with Abraham, their father Abraham, that all the seed of the earth would be blessed through Abraham, through Abraham's seed. In the course, that was the Lord Jesus Christ. And also an extension of that would be the Jewish people uh, bringing the good news of the Lord the, and the Jesus Christ to all the Gentile nations during the thousand year reign or the kingdom. Now I'm covering a lot here, but we got to compare this with the body of Christ, the age which we are living in today. We are living in the age of grace. And uh, it is, uh, like I said before, you don't find it in the previous scriptures which we were looking at. But the Apostle Paul here says in Ephesians 2, he says, Wherefore remember, now he's, he's writing to believers, Gentile believers, that ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh made by hands. In other words, the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, are the ones that called the Gentiles the uncircumcision. Why? Because circumcision was for a sign way back in Genesis chapter 17, that they were part of uh, that covenant that God made with Abraham. Okay, that at that time, you were without Christ. Back when God was dealing with the nation of Israel, the Gentiles were completely without Christ. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Strangers from the covenants of promise including the covenant that was given to Abraham, uh, God made with Abraham, having no hope and without God in the world. So just this 
these verses right here, which was in green up there, aliens from the commonwealth in Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, without God in the world, how can you take Gentiles now and put them in the first part of Acts when God was dealing with the nation of Israel only, not Gentiles? There's no way that, uh, <clears throat> that Gentiles could be there. But, the but now, the last part there in verse 13, it says, But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who are sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. So he's speaking of the truth that now in the age of grace, Gentiles are made near by the blood of Christ. Okay, Acts chapter 4. And as they spake unto the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Uh, okay, so here we have Peter and John. Uh, it says, And they spake unto the people, and the people bring the priest, the captain of the temple, the Sadducees, and the Sadducees came upon them. So when Peter and John were starting to remind these Jewish believers what happened to the impotent man, remember the man that was uh, at, the, at the gate of the temple who was, had never walked since birth? And by the way, uh, Luke reminded me last week that I kind of messed up a little bit. I said that the beggar was in his 30s. Well, you'll see in Acts chapter 4 here, uh, he's in his 40s. <laughs> So, uh, anyway, I'm glad you're listening. You can correct me when I'm wrong. So, <laughs> anyway, he's, he's, the, the, the verse here, it says he's above 40. So, we know he's at least 40 years old. But anyway, this is the Peter and John speaking to the priests uh, and the Sadducees about the, the, the man that was healed. And uh, everybody was wondering and looking at him because he, he got up and jumped and leaped and into the temple and was praising God. That and the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead, the resurrection. Now you need to know something a little bit about the Sadducees. Uh, the Sadducees and the Pharisees were different sects that uh, were formed during that 400 years of silence between Malachi and Matthew. In your Bible, between the Old Testament and the New Testament, so-called New Testament, there's 400 years when God was silent in regards to the nation of Israel. During that time is when we have the Pharisees and the Sadducees forming groups of people. Now, one of them believes in the resurrection, and the one, one group did not. And it's easy to remember the Sadducees were sad, you see, because they did not believe in the resurrection. The Pharisees were fair, you see, because they did believe in the resurrection. So that's how you can remember that. Now, it's interesting, if you look up Sadducees and try to study where they're from, and what, you know, we had the governmental body of Israel at that time was the Sanhedrin. Well, the Sanhedrin was made up of uh, <coughs> priests, a lot of the priests, uh, a lot of other Jews that were in the hierarchy of, of the government. But mostly, guess what? It was made up of the Sadducees. Most of the Sadducees were in the Sanhedrin, the governmental body. And we're going to even find out that even the high priest and the priest of the temple were Sadducees. What did the Sadducees believe in? They did not believe in the resurrection. So you can understand the depravity that the nation of Israel was in at this particular time when they had the governing body, the, the high priest and the priest in the temple did not even believe in the resurrection. So you can understand why the governmental body was after the Lord Jesus Christ, um, which we'll see more of as we go on here. Be agreed that they taught the people and preached Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Now here is a, uh, uh, a verse there, Matthew twenty-two twenty-three. 23. It says, And the same day came to him the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection. So there's, there is another verse later on in Acts 2, which we'll see. 
talking about the Sadducees that believed in resurrection or did not and the Pharisees who did. Okay, Acts chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold or custody until the next day. And then they kept them overnight. It was becoming in, in the evening, so they, uh, uh, <clears throat> they kept them overnight. For it was now eventide. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed. And the number of men was about 5,000. Okay, this is Peter's second sermon. How many, how many were saved because of the result of Peter's first sermon? 3,000. 3, so in Acts chapter 2, which is Peter's first sermon, uh, it says 3,000, and actually plus, because verse 47 of Acts chapter 2, it says, and those uh, uh, whom God, uh, who believe, were added to the church. In other words, there were more than 3,000 that were added. Now in Acts chapter 4, verse 4, it says that the number of men was about 5,000. So 5,000, 3,000, we got at least 8,000 souls now are in this church that have been saved uh, since a few days ago at Pentecost. Okay, now Peter is addressing the Sanhedrin, the governmental body of the church. And he says that it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes, Annas the high priest, Caiaphas and John and Alexander. Uh, Annas was the high priest. Remember the high priest, he did his duties once a year going into the temple or previously into the tabernacle. Uh, Caiaphas was his son-in-law, Annas's son-in-law. And we see after a few years that Annas was the high priest, then Caiaphas became the high priest. And, uh, <clears throat> but the um, Annas still had a lot to say about what was going on through his son-in-law, Caiaphas. And then we see John and Alexandria. Now, John was just another member uh, of the priesthood at this particular time. Uh, there's no other record of who that John really is. And possibly, it could be the, the, uh, the brother, I don't think it is, I'm not going that. <laughs> and Alexander, another person named Alexander, which we don't know a whole lot about. But we know that they were in the uh, upper echelon of the governmental body of, of uh, Israel at that particular time. And as many were of the kindred or the relationship of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, now that's speaking of Peter and John, they set them in the midst of them. In other words, they kind of surrounded them. They got them in the middle, and they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? Have you done what? That they healed this beggar, the lame man, at the entrance of the temple. By what power are you doing this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people, the elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means is he made whole? I should, I kind of ended that wrong. Ye rulers of the people, this is Peter now speaking, the elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means is he made whole? Be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. Now Peter turns it right around, and he says, concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, it was through the Lord Jesus Christ, he is the one that made this man whole. We had nothing to do with it. It was the Lord Jesus Christ who healed this man. And, who, and then, he, then he says, By Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you have crucified. He turns it right back on them again. I don't know. You, would you have the, uh, uh, the strength and stuff that, you know, just you and another man that was another apostle, and all of a sudden you were surrounded by all these 
high echelon in the government of Israel, they're surrounding you, and Peter just tells it like it is. You crucified him. The same thing that he said in his first sermon, uh, that you crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders. The stone, of course, referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. Many times in Scripture, the Lord Jesus Christ is referred to as the rock or the stone which was set not of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. When they were building the temple, the story goes anyway, when they were building the temple, that early on, when they were laying the stones, and of course the stones were not made right next to the temple, they were at a quarry way far away, they were cut and then brought to the temple, and put together but this one stone which was the cornerstone was put way out away from the temple the building because they weren't ready for it yet and it was like grass grew up around it and so forth and uh, the stone which was set not of you builders which become the head of the corner was eventually the head of the corner but you know there are verses that says that they the stone would be uh, became a stumbling block well just kind of picture that <laughs> Uh, where they were all these all these men constructing the temple, walking around the temple, and the grass was high, and all of a sudden they stumbled over this stone. It was the cornerstone, which was representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. And spiritually, you can see how that fits spiritually with the nation of Israel also. Back in Matthew 21, just the related, related relationship to this, Jesus saith unto them, Did ye ever read the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Now, he's speaking of the kingdom of God shall be taken from you. That's the rulers of the nation of Israel. The kingdom of God will be taken from you. Why? Because they rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. And given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. The little flock. The small group of believers. That's who the kingdom is going to be given to. And which we see in the first part of Acts here. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will, it will grind him to powder. Now, if you know anything about the, the image that Daniel saw uh, of the empires of the future of the nation of Israel, we know that the, uh, the empires from the head on down, all the way down to the ankles, are all history. But there is an empire, and some believe that is the Roman Empire, revived Roman Empire, the feet. Remember the feet and the ankles. The, the legs were made of iron, which represented Rome. And uh, <clears throat> we have the feet, which were mixed with iron and clay. And we have the ten toes. The ten toes representing the ten nations or ten powers or ten kings, which, which we're going to see in Revelation on Wednesday evening, who they are. Uh, maybe not who they are, but how many they are. <laughs> and uh, anyway, but what happens to that image is Daniel sees that big image and... Uh, when a stone comes out of heaven and hits the feet of that image and the whole image collapses and the feet and everything are all just ground to powder. That's what's going to happen in the tribulation period when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. And we see that the uh, whatever it is, the right revived Roman Empire, the ten uh, kings and so forth in the tribulation period, <clears throat> when Christ comes back, there will be literally ground to powder. Okay, so many times the Lord Jesus Christ is referred to as the stone or the rock. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. A very familiar verse, and we know that there is no other. No other way to God except through the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only way. John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. <clears throat> now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John 
and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. <clears throat> now, this unlearned and ignorant doesn't mean that they're, they're unlearned and they're stupid. <laughs> ignorant means they just didn't have the knowledge. And, uh, of course, who were they? They were just a couple fishermen. When Jesus come along the shore and saw both of them, they said, uh, the Lord says, come follow me. And they did. And they were nothing but fishermen. So they did not know a lot concerning the Lord Jesus Christ and so forth. But now they do. <laughs> when they perceived they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. They took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Why did they know so much now? Because they had been with the Lord Jesus Christ during his ministry, the three-year ministry. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them. Here is the beggar who was healed is standing with them. Now how can they deny what has happened? You'd think that they would immediately believe in the Lord Jesus Christ or who he was. They could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves. So they said, uh-oh, we've got to have a meeting. So they left John and Peter stand there. They went off by themselves to discuss this. They conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a noble miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. Now by this time, how many believers have already believed at least 8,000. 8,000 plus. So the people were speaking here, really. But that's why they said, it, you know, for that indeed a notable miracle has been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem. I mean, when they, Peter and John spoke to the, all those people at Pentecost, so many believed that one time there was 3,000, now there's 5,000, and now there's over 8,000 people that have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. But that it spread no further among the people. See, now, they didn't want this to spread anymore. Because if it spread more among the people, what's going to happen to them? They're going to be overruled by the people. And, uh, you know, as you read through this, it kind of reminds you of something that's maybe going on in this country. <laughs> but anyway. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in his name. Okay, we're going to, we're going to threaten them. You're going to stop doing this. That's talking about the Lord Jesus. They called them, commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So that wasn't going to stop them. Uh, they believed in the Lord Jesus Christ because they had been, been with him for the three years of ministry, and now they see this man healed. Uh, they've been at Pentecost. They see uh, those speaking in tongues. And also, by the way, all those speaking in tongues, if you go back and look at the Great Commission, what would happen to all that? All those that believed also had power of healing and to speak in tongues and so forth. And it was just mushrooming. Well, what was taking place? It was the beginning of the tribulation period. The things that are going to happen. The Holy Spirit was working. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. For the man was above 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. Uh, we're going to stop right there. We don't have time to finish the chapter, so we're going to stop there. and be good good uh, place to take a break here. So, shall we pray? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the Lord Jesus Christ and what he means to us today in the age of grace. That he has manifested his grace and his mercy upon us in this age of grace. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this and we just pray, Heavenly Father, now that you'd be with us where we, as we go our homeward way. Guide and protect us, and that we might come back together and have fellowship around your word once again. As we ask it in your precious name. Amen.